Good evening, everybody. My name is Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. How you all doing? I'll tell you, this is a real pleasure for me to be here tonight. And I am um, had the privilege last night of me meeting Ian and his wife, Gloria, when they arrived from Scotland uh, at National Airport. And he's been in our country now for about 24 hours. And we've uh, had lunch and went a little bit, a little sightseeing today. And um, it's just delightful to have him with us. And he will be participating. I'm going to get a plug in for our pilots meeting, which is how the whole connection. I'll have. I'll leave this up at the uh, secretary's table or on this table um, for anybody who wants to pick it up after the meeting. But once a year we have a Pearl Harbor Day meeting, not to celebrate Pearl Harbor uh, per se, but to uh, have a get together of uh, alcoholic pilots who are no longer drinking while flying, much to the uh, safety of the airways, but that are now in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a little bit of a different meeting, and if you'd like to see uh, how safe the friendly skies are, why, come on over to uh, St. Exxon's uh, over in Roslyn uh, at 8.30 on this Sunday, and we will have 20 of these uh, erstwhile aviators talk for two minutes each, and you will see a very vintage film that is only shown in this country once a year. It's a six-minute black-and-white 16-millimeter um, film about carrier operations during a blackout. And these are um, a very rare film that shows what would happen if these pilots were drinking and aboard a Navy carrier. And so if you're interested in that, we ask you to come by and take a look at that. Now, the reason I'm up here tonight is um, because some couple years ago, I guess, I got to corresponding back and forth, and I'm going to let Ian tell a little bit about how this happened. And uh, two alcoholics in two different countries started to get to know one another through the mail. And I heard all about, uh, through Ian's letters, how AA was in Scotland and uh, how he got sober over there, some of the differences between that country and this country, but mostly there's similarities. Mostly it's the same basic program of our 12 steps and helping one another. But it's just a little bit different environment, and uh, so we shared back and forth for all this uh, period of time, and somehow we managed to put together a arrangement and where Ian and uh, his wife Gloria could come over here and spend a week or so, 10 days with us, and go to a lot of meetings and share a little bit, and we're looking forward to the rest of his visit. But one of the conditions that we put on it was that he would share with us at one of our open meetings uh, his story and a little bit about how this trip came to pass. And so I wish you would all join me in giving a nice Seminary Road Group welcome to uh, Ian D. from Scotland. Ian, come on up. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. My name is Ian Douglas, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Now, I have to be very careful I remember that. I don't mean the alcoholic bit. I can remember that bit. It's the Douglas bit. You see, I wouldn't say Ian Douglas in Scotland because they're all so anonymous. That I would get shot if I said who I was. Not that that matters, because where I live, it's pretty remote, and they will tell me what I'm growing in the garden from five miles away. But uh, the group I belong to could meet in that yellow box there. Uh, and they're pretty anonymous fellows, too. There's Jimmy, and there's Jimmy, and Jimmy, and there's me, and there's a fellow called Michael. In fact, we have to call one of them Spin Dryer Jimmy. Uh, in fact, he calls himself that. And that's a long story, and you did say 25 past 9, so. <laughs> And the other Jimmy has decided he's got to be Sinclair, so we've, we've got some organization into it now. But I'm, uh, so a group of five is about the most I have <laughs> tackled. But sharing an AA, uh, in my experience, 
in Britain, not in Scotland only, that's only been the last 12 years, but sharing in, in AA in Britain, I think, is pretty much the same as over here. Uh, one thing I am looking forward to doing in the next uh, 10, 12 days is finding out a lot more about uh, Alcoholics Anonymous because I think there's a lot, I think we still have an awful lot to learn uh, on our side. You know, I'm, I'm aware of it. I think we're all aware of it. Things are going, things are going well in Scotland especially. I think we've got a very good attitude towards AA in Scotland. Uh, I'm not knocking the English for that. Although I'll knock the English for anything you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, we usually identify ourselves the same way as you do, and, and I'll just take a minute to do that. I don't want to start going up into the wild blue yonder, because I'm going to get plenty of chance to do that in the next 12 days. But I did all my drinking in the Air Force. Now, just recently, I've been rereading a lot of AA stuff. Well, I must tell you. Just recently, I reread the big book, and I hadn't read it in detail for maybe three or four years. And I said to Gloria, Christ, somebody's rewritten this. <laughs> What's going on? And, and I read some of it out to her. And she said, we went through that word for word in 1962, and it hasn't changed a bit. I said, well, it has. And then I realized that what was happening has been a progressive thing, that my whole attitude to the big book and a lot of other things has changed. I think at first, this possibility that things would change after I got sober scared me. And, uh, and uh, I wasn't anxious to see things change. I had found, uh, I found a life raft and I grabbed hold of it. And what was changing, in fact, wasn't the program. It was me and it was my perception of the program. So a lot of the things that I see in the program now have come to me over quite a long period. And I'm still learning. And I think that's the wonderful thing about the AA program is that I'm still learning. It will never, this is a process which for me it's never going to end. Anyway, I want to say, uh, t let me try and tell you very briefly something about my pattern. When I was reading about uh, alcoholism, as I think from Alcoholics Anonymous just recently, and it was a, it was a non-alcoholics anonymous publication. It was the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I know you have over here. I'm just, just a sheer casual uh, acquaintance with this thing in the local library in Dumbarton, about 25 miles away, and I looked up alcoholism, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that Alcoholics Anonymous got a very good write-up in there, and I thought, well, you know, what was the matter with us all? Why didn't we, uh, when we had a drinking problem, why didn't we just go to the library and look, <laughs> look up the Encyclopedia Britannica? It was all there, and what's more, we should sue them, because there are long screeds of the big book that have been plagiarized into the Encyclopedia Britannica. But what did strike me was, that it identified uh, several uh, of the sort of causal factors. And I, so I had, a, I had a sort of run down memory drain again and looked at the causal factors. And I, and I, I looked at uh, the sort of business of heredity. You know, to what extent does heredity affect uh, alcoholism? Have I inherited it? And the answer is no. Uh, my father was a soldier, and a damn good soldier, and he was a drinker, and he was a damn good drinker, but he was not an alcoholic. My mother is not an alcoholic, but my mother is definitely a strange woman. A very strange woman. <laughs> and I think, I, I, as, much, as much as I love my mother, I... I have to, when I review my life and see if I had any sort of emotional problem which might have predisposed me to alcoholism, uh, I think mum has a couple of things to answer for. I don't want to be rude because I don't know what I can get away with in, in this audience. <laughs> But 
When I was four, I went to a little school in England, this was, because my father moved around a lot. And this is why I speak with an English accent and I'm not as well come from the Corpals. I can do both. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, four years old at an army school and all the boys used to sit on one side and there was an aisle and the girls sat on the other side. And I was brought up very, very strictly and there was no hanky-panky and you, uh, you, it was very strict. And I was looking at the little girl and I can remember this so clearly although I was only four years old the light came in from the left and the teacher was up there and all the girls sat on that side and I was looking at this girl and I thought she's different from me and I showed her what the difference was and she was not impressed but a lot of women are like that but the teacher was the teacher was the teacher dragged me I immediately felt this excruciating pain in my left ear and I was dragged away and stood in the corner like that and I remember for the rest of the afternoon I was looking at these holes in the woodwork and I thought, I wonder what those holes are. And they were from drawing pins. Now that's how clear my memory is. As soon as school was finished, I got hold of my mother and my mother threw a fit. And she said that if this happened again, this was going to get cut off. Amputation. <laughs> well now, we were very poor. I only had two things. I had a goldfish called Herbert, who lived in a bowl, <laughs> and I had my little Willie. And... <laughs> now, the threat of amputation made a very serious impact on me, <laughs> and it lasted for quite some time. <laughs> I grew up, I grew up a sensitive child. <laughs> Very sensitive. Yeah. I, uh, at a very early age, I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I had a lot of heroes in the First World War, and uh, I used to read this book called Wings. One of them was by a uh, child called Ernst Udet, who was a general in the Luftwaffe in the last war, also an alcoholic, committed suicide. But this was his... Uh, this was his autobiography and uh, from his early days, from the early days. And one of his stunts as a kid was he jumped off the roof with a couple of umbrellas and I did this and uh, that was my first flight. I came out of hospital about three or four weeks later. <laughs> but from a very early age, I decided I was going to be a pilot in the Air Force. I wrote to Air Ministry when I was nine years old and they actually gave me a reply and I can remember the reply I got. Yes, good, you know, wait your turn. And they sent me a pamphlet. And I, but I wondered, because I was such a sensitive child, this uh, strict upbringing of mine, although I, was, I seemed to be physically okay, and uh, I was working hard at school, as hard as a nine, ten-year-old will, and I, uh, I, I got a bit worried about, why was I, I was a sensitive boy, and this didn't seem to matter, because all the more I read, the more it, I discovered that pilots were high-strung, and best fighter pilots were the highest Strong and they were quickest off the mark. That's right. I said, well, it's fine, okay, as long as this business of uh, whatever this is. And I now know that it was guilt. And I wasn't guilty of anything. I didn't know anything. My mother knew, but she wouldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, at, I just want to round this bit off because this gives you the background. When I was about on the threshold of puberty, Dad said, get in a car, I've got something to tell you. And we drove about five or six miles, and he said, uh, words to this effect. He gave me a kind of pseudo-scientific uh, description of uh, family life and what caused families. And I thought, this is definitely for the bird, this is not for me, because I already had experience of family life, and I didn't want any more of this. So I just thought, well, that's something that I can put off for a long, long time, family life. But he said, well, apart from the family life, there are other two possibilities. He said, there are girls, and uh, he said, and that's a pretty risky business. And the thing, he, as he pointed out to me, the thing that, mo that might have got cut off when I was younger was going to drop off. If I <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing was that if I decided to go solo, if I... 
if I decided to go solo on this, I was going to finish up being arrested by the police for writing rude words in the lavatory and stuck in the loony bin with the rest of them. Well, that completed my sexual education. <laughs> and it, it wasn't until I joined the Air Force at the age of 16 and met a Sunday school teacher at the age of 17, and she took me in hand, and in a month she undid all the damage that my parents had done. <laughs> Except for the fact that by now I was in the Air Force and I was doing what I wanted to do. The war ended. I didn't get to be a pilot during the war, but I, I did manage it after the war, and I went, eventually I got into uh, the equivalent of your max transport command, which meant I was away from home a lot, uh, flying up and down the old uh, the British Empire air route to the Far East and lots of other interesting places. It got less interesting as time went by because there were fewer places for us to go to. Uh, you <laughs> and, uh, and the long distance bit got even longer. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we were operating an Air Force on a shoestring, but it used to lead to some sort of exciting moments, but I don't want to go into that. What I want to do is to tell you about the drinking content of it. I didn't drink and fly because you don't drink eight hours before a flight. But what I was, I was on a squadron that used to drink every moment when they weren't eight hours from a flight. And when we were uh, down the route, and sometimes you didn't see the other guys on the squadron for maybe for what, three or four months, and you pass one another in a place like uh, Nagombo, just outside uh, Colombo in Salon, we used to land in, in between the coconut trees. We only had 1,700 yards four engines without breaking propellers. It was exciting. But you could get you could get gin there if if in the officer's mess you said, I would like a, lem a lemonade or a tomato juice, it was buy your own because a large gin was cheaper. And we would meet one another at places like this. And of course, we had marvelous time and it didn't cost us very much money. And uh, uh, I've got to use a rude word here, but it's a rude word that we used to use. Whenever we met anywhere, it was, well, shall we go? where should we go? Singapore. Let's go to the happy world. Uh, right. We will get pissed first. And that's what we did. We got pissed first. Wherever we were in the world, we met up with each other. We got pissed first. And when we were all back at base, that's what we did. And what's more, officially, it was a good thing to do. Once a month, we'd dress up in our best bib, best bib and tucker and behave like uh, little angels in the nest for two hours. And then when everybody was sufficiently well-oiled, we'd start ripping our uh, ties off. You get through a hell of a lot of ties like that, and even a sleeve or a shirt. Depends how long you stayed. Uh, four o'clock in the morning, you'd be practically naked. <laughs> but it, it, was a, it was a social life which... Uh, which drinking was actually encouraged because we could all take it and we knew that we could all take it and uh, we inherited a legacy from the wartime RAF uh, of being a bunch of hard drinkers and a lot of the fellows were in fact survivors who were in transport plan were in fact survivors of uh, bomber command not a lot but they were there and uh, and heavy drinking was, was part of the game, and I enjoyed it. Not that I liked the taste of drink at all, but it did something for me. It helped me to relax. I, I can tell you how much I didn't like drinking, really, because I used to drink all the silly things like the cures. I would much rather drink a bottle of Cointreau or Benedictine than, uh, than drink beer or whiskey. And coming from a Scotsman, that's sacrilege. But I got the taste for gin, and I thought gin didn't smell. I didn't understand about vodka. <laughs> Vodka's unpatriotic, anyway. It was at that time. But the gin, that was okay. And I thought it wasn't uh, something that other people would notice. And I thought it was a good medicine for me, because... Uh, when there wasn't one of the squadron parties on, I found that 
just a small gin or two help me to relax a bit and I can honestly say that I know when I took my first alcoholic drink although I was a heavy drinker and, uh, and at times with my friends uh, was proud of the fact that I could compete with the best of them for drinking other people under the table I had I thought complete control over it and I, and I stuck to the various rules like the eight hour rule uh, which I heard described the other day as throttle to bottle or bottle to throttle whichever way you run and when I broke that rule was my that was my first alcoholic drink and that's as clear to me now as uh, as, as anything I can remember about my drinking period it's, it was a ridiculous occasion I uh, I'll just take a moment to tell you about it I was doing what we always had to do back at the base whether if if didn't matter how much flying you'd done that month when you got back to base you had to do six hours what we call continuation training that meant wearing out airplane tires and, uh, and doing some night flying even if you'd done nothing but night flying every night for the previous month you still had to go through this routine and I was scheduled for one of these things in the afternoon and I felt a little bit uptight just a little bit uptight I went to the officer's mess at 10 o'clock in the morning and I said to one of the stewards get me two bottles of Arctic kale, put them in the ladies room where nobody ever went in the ladies room and just leave them there and I went there and I drank these two bottles of Arctic kale, uh to make me feel better to make me feel a little bit better and why did I need to feel better? I need, needed to feel a bit better because the previous day on the day part of this continuation training caper I had lined the aircraft up on the runway and just as I was going to open up four engines, the four throttles the runway tilted 30 degrees down now I don't know if you can imagine what vert vertigo, a mild attack of vertigo but you know even standing on the ground for, for the floor to tilt 30 degrees is unnerving and it's the sort of thing that happens when you're either drunk or when you're tired and obviously I was tired on this occasion but if it's happening at the moment that you're opening the circles of one of Her Majesty's transport aeroplanes and it wasn't all that reliable <laughs> thing anyway uh, it was the best three-engined aircraft the Air Force ever had. Uh, you just had the hope that all four engines are going to work. But as they opened the throttle, this runway tilted down. And I thought, God, I've got to stop. Uh, fortunately, there was only the crew with me. And I thought, well, I must stop. And I thought, God, if I stop, I'll have to go and see the ammo and tell him what's happened. I thought, no, hell with it. So I took off downhill. And it frightened the life out of me. But afterwards, the, my brains evened up and whatever it was in my year, whatever it was, eased off. But the following day, I knew that this was going to happen again. Why did I? I don't know. I know. I didn't know it was going to happen again. I feared, I suppose, it was going to happen again. And that's why I had these two bottles of Arctic Ale, and that was my first alcoholic drink. And I didn't need those. I didn't need that drink at all. All I, all I needed, in fact, looking back on it, I think all I needed was a damn good sleep. But it set a pattern. On the, on the basis of the environment that I'd had up until then of being uh, of, of feeling of, of guilt uh, tremend I was tremendously responsive to authority uh, and I think that gives you the picture uh, I, I wanted to achieve I had to work hard I always felt I had to work hard to make up for these for, and, my, incapa my incapacity, whatever it was, you know, I, I, I wasn't going to measure up. So I would, I would overcompensate by by working too hard. I mean, the hours I wasted uh, doing promotion exams uh, <laughs> before I needed to, that kind of rubbish, which I'm sure a lot of us in, in uh, AA, uh, you, you know, we, this is a common feature with us. But uh, what happened? The drinking uh, I recognised as being a kind of a I suppose whenever I felt uptight whenever I felt a bit uh, 
a bit dubious about myself, I had a drink. And it was a socially acceptable thing to do. It was encouraged and fine. Lovely. I did it. And it went on and it got worse. It got worse and worse and worse. And I'm not going to bore you with how, how it did get worse. Uh, there were some amusing incidents in it. Uh, we, didn't, we don't go in for automatic cars, uh, automatic gear shifts. And Gloria couldn't drive at the time. And there used, but there used to be a pub about 10 miles away from one, uh, one place I was at, at the headquarters, doing a staff job. Every time they took me off flying, I got drunker because I didn't have any constraint. And so me getting a staff job, me getting promotion and getting a staff job was actually the worst thing that could possibly happen to me because that I drank more then because there was no, there was no inhibition. I, the, the drink was then needing a drink to feed itself. And when we wanted to go out, Gloria went with me and she's always backed me up. She even backed me up with, for these things. She couldn't talk me out of it, but she'd go with me. And she needed to go with me because I used to get terrible double vision. And uh, I used to work the gear shift and the pedals, and she used to steer the car. And that's, <laughs> and that's how we used to get back. That's how we used to get back from this pub. In fact, there was one stretch of straight road that I thought was a three-lane highway until I, <laughs> until I discovered one day when I after I got sober, I went along the same road and I found a, one single row of cat's eyes down the middle. And I always used to drive down the central lane, but uh, that's beside the point. But the uh, now it was strange. I had uh, I, I recognised I had a problem. Uh, I had seen other alcoholics and, uh, and I felt sorry for them. I had. Uh, two friends who were both wing commanders at one station I was at and they both died and they were both they were both alcoholics and we we all knew that there was something wrong with their drinking one of my greatest friends in, in the Air Force a fellow who had been a prisoner of all the Germans he uh, I saw him once sitting having breakfast outside the mess in, in Nicosia in Cyprus and he was having a cigarette and a bottle of Rexina for his breakfast and I thought this guy's got style and about six months later he shot himself and he had everything going for him the two wing commanders died Dickie Hardman shot himself and I thought I'm really sorry for these fellows they've they've got a problem and it's been alcoholism I've got a problem too but it's not alcoholism uh, and I couldn't see that I was going that way I got this staff job I used to go in all the little pubs down in the valley rather than have them know up at the headquarters how much I was drinking. And there was a, one of these country gentlemen sort of fellows who used to stagger around on a bicycle. Presumably he'd had his driving license taken away. And I, I was in one of the pubs one day and I said to the landlord, you know that chap comes in here? Oh yes, you mean Bill. I said, uh, what's the matter? And he said, quiet. He said, he's an alcoholic. He'll come in here and he'll have three gins or whiskey or whatever it was, he said, and then he'll go. But he's an alcoholic. He'll go in all the pubs in the valley, uh, before, and he'll, he'll probably go to about ten pubs, and he'll have a couple of whiskeys in each. And I said, oh, that's a shame. You know, I often see him in these, in the other pubs, and it didn't strike me that I... <laughs> it did not occur to me that I had the same problem. <laughs> It got uh, it got so that once they put once they put me on the ground and it was for a week and I didn't have any constraints and I got blind drunk and I just didn't know what was happening and I and I went to see the doctor and I said I feel dreadful he said you feel like committing suicide and I said no I said I feel like seeing a psychiatrist no you don't see a psychiatrist I said yes I do I want to see an Air Force psychiatrist and they sent me up to see an Air Force psychiatrist. This was a disaster. <laughs> this guy said to me, and he wasn't all that much older than me, he said, uh, do you uh, have any problems with drink? And I lied, of course, but for protection. I said, no. Nope. Uh, I said, uh, do you have any uh, sexual hang-ups? And I said, no. Nope. So if they're hanging down, that would be a problem, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm okay in that area too. Uh, he said, well, I can't think what it is. So he then, we then spent the rest of the afternoon discussing his sexual hang-ups. 
This is weird. Now, he did me no good at all because I tried to explain to this fella that, uh, that sometimes I got a bit uptight and that I was apprehensive and that I was most apprehensive if I wasn't flying. And uh, if anybody grounded me for any length of time by giving me some idiotic soft job to do, I felt bad. And I really wanted to live in the air. That itself was crazy. Uh, and I think the reason for that was that I wanted to live in the air because I knew that if I was in the air all the time, I wouldn't be apprehensive about getting up in the air again. And so that's what I did. I used to do my trips. I used to do the other guy's trips. And if there weren't any trips going around, I used to fly as a passenger. And that was crazy. That made me tired. And that's how things were going. But this, I couldn't get this uh, across and I, I just wasted my time and I wasted the time. And so that's what I did. I used to do my trips. I used to do the other guy's trips. And if there weren't any trips going around, I used to fly as a passenger. And that was crazy. That made me tired. And that's how things were going. But this, I couldn't get this uh, across and I, I just wasted my time and I wasted the psychiatrist's time over this. He gave me a treat. He gave me a real treat. He said, well, you've got some funny ideas, he said, but at least you're not as bad as one of the enlisted men, as you call them, in, in the next ward. He said, look, I've got a guy down there. He thinks if he walks too far, he'll fall off the edge of the world. Now, that was the worst thing that fellow could have said to me, because in my particular state of mind at that time, I spent the next three days worrying if this was ever going to happen to me, that I was going to get in that condition. And I did some pretty heavy drinking as a result of that worry. <laughs> anyway, I got all right again, and they said, we'll go back on the squadron, and I, and I was okay until the next time it happened. And uh, once again, I said, I'm, I've, I've got, uh, I've, there is something wrong. And they said, well, Francie, uh, uh, I, if you like to, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again. And I forget what they did this time, but it, it was... Uh, Oh, physical exercise, I think. It was, it was, a, lot, it was a load of nonsense. I must tell you, I was, I was suffering from the transport command pilot's occupational disease, which was what we called farmers, which is Cockney Rhyme slang for farmer giles, or piles, because we had a very hard seat in this Hastings, and we were sitting on it for seven hours, and I had a marginal case of this. And in, in this... Uh, in this hospital they sent to me this time, as part of my cure for alcoholism, they, they told me that uh, I would have to put these <laughs> things in the silver paper. He said, do you know how to use them? And I said, well, I can guess the sort of bullet-shaped thing with the silver paper on it. He says, I hope you don't mind me asking, sir, but we did have a warrant officer here, and he, uh, he, was, he did a month's course of these, and uh, warrant officer is like a sergeant major, you know. And he said... Uh, the sergeant, sick bay attendant, and he said, uh, after a month, this warrant officer got very upset, and he said, the sergeant said to him, well, are they doing any good? He said, they're doing me no good at all. And that silver paper, it is like thuggery. <laughs> <laughs> but this was, this was my second, this was my second go uh, uh, at this. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until the third go, it wasn't until the third go that I walked in with a bottle of gin in 1962. Gloria had, uh, had, Gloria and I had come to the decision that I was an alcoholic. And I went to the doctor and I said, uh, there was a friend of mine who was pretty high up as, uh, as uh, doctors go, a group captain in the Air Force is, is fairly well up for a, for a doctor. And I said to him, and he was a friend of mine, we used to drink a lot together. I said, I'm an alcoholic, John. I need to do something about it. He said, no, it's nonsense, you're not an alcoholic. But I said, but I must go back and see these psychiatrists again because they seem to be the only people who might be able to help. And he said, well, if you must, you must. And so I went up. And this time, when I went in to see these guys, the, the, other, the other group captain, Paddy O'Connor, I put a bottle of gin on the table and said, that's my problem. And he said, yes, well, hang on. He said, you know, since we saw you last, we have come to a realization that this can be a problem and, uh, and, they, and they got me on a, an alcoholic uh, course of civilian unit. And that introduced me properly to AA. I had actually written off a big book and I'd read it and I'd learned it 
and I'd written off all the literature, I'd got me all the literature, and I'd read that. One thing I didn't do, I did not go to a meeting. There weren't all that many meetings around, but I did not go to a meeting. I was just enough to read this book and to read all this literature. And I did it, and I read it very thoroughly, very systematically, and I stayed sober for six weeks. As Gloria will tell you, that's the worst six weeks of her life, including the drinking period. And, and my own staff at that time used to complain about it. Uh, life was miserable. Uh, it was miserable for me. And it also introduced me to the progressiveness of the disease, because at the end of six weeks, I had a major problem on my hands. The major problem was this. I had a boy of four, or six, about six years old, and a boy of three. And I had a train set out, and it was uh, a certain gauge, and I'd spent a lot of time assembling this, and the, the, the three-year-old came along with an airplane, which was, if, if it was to the same scale, would have a mile wingspan. And I said this wasn't right. I tried to point, and I lost my temper with my two boys, bless them, and I went out, and I went to the mess, and I drank all day, and when I finished that night, after six weeks of not drinking, I bought a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of rum, brandy, I think I bought one of each, shoved it in the car, drove to London, I, uh, I, gave, I gave a soldier a lift on Salisbury Plain. He was walking a lot, Salisbury Plain is a pretty, uh, don't know, pretty rugged area, and this fellow was hitching a lift, and I gave him a lift, and almost as soon as he was in the car, he was begging to get out. Uh, I, I, got, I got as far as Blackbush Airport. Uh, he did actually get out. I think I came some traffic lights, and he just jumped. Uh, I, I got to Blackbush Airport, and uh, just outside there's a cafe. It's one of these roadside cafes. And it's not the sort of place that a senior officer in the Air Force would go in. It's all full of tough lorry drivers. And I went in there and I had hallucinations. I never had hallucinations in my life. I thought that Gloria had been with me. This was one o'clock in the morning. And that these, there were about six of them. And they were all bigger than me. And uh, I, I had hallucinated that, I, that my wife had been with me and that they had shanghaied her and gone. And, and a fight ensued. Now, uh, afterwards, uh, well, two days afterwards, uh, this sort of came back to me that there had been this fight. And in fact, there was some evidence that there had been a fight, too. <laughs> and I used to box for the Air Force so I could look after myself. These were, uh, these were decent sized fellows, yeah. But uh, I, I didn't know whether it had happened. I didn't know whether it had happened until weeks later. I saw this familiar building on the roadside and it said cafe and there were lorries parked out, trucks parked, big trucks parked outside and I thought, ah, it's a dream but I'll go in and I went in and as soon as I went in the fellow behind the counter, get out, he said. <laughs> it was true. This, so this had actually happened to me and that was six weeks. I'd been off the booze for six weeks and I, it had become uncontrollable and I need no, I don't need any, I don't need to read that it is uh, progressive. I proved this, but unfortunately I didn't get sober then, I couldn't. Uh, I did get sober through the alcoholic unit I, and with the help and the guidance of AA. And this was the first time in my life that I ever opened up to anybody. And I met friends in AA that spoke to me in a way that I had never been spoken to by other people before. Uh, there was a kind of openness that, uh, that I had never experienced. And this did me good. And I, for the first time in my life, was able to talk about the kind of things that I've been alluding to tonight. Uh, I, some of them, I've, I've missed out a miserable bit. So you've got to fill that in for yourself. Uh, I I don't know how to describe it. I had gone through my entire life thinking that nobody else was going to be interested in all this rubbish that was piled up here, and I couldn't get rid of it. I, my wife, Gloria, bless her, she used to try hard and, and do this, but she was too close to me. She was, she was just too close to me. You know, we, we were living together, and it needed, to be, it needed to be outside the family. My dad, just before he died, he tried to help me, but I don't think that worked either. Uh, he 
uh, he didn't, he wasn't able to help me. My mother wasn't able to help me. In fact, my mother said to me two years after I was in, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm doing very well, uh, I, I did see my mother, and uh, she said, where, where are you going? She, she stayed with us for a couple of days. Where are you going this evening? I said, I'm going to a meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous in Ilford. She said, you're not still hanging around with those drunks, are you? <laughs> not still hanging around with those drunks. But I, uh, I, I learned I learned a lot. Well, I think we all learned a lot. I, I learned an awful lot about I learned an awful lot about life. I learned I even began to learn a few things about myself. But most of all I learned I learned to be able to take it a bit lighter, a bit a bit easier. A bit easier on myself. Uh, and I eventually Glory will tell you no, but I eventually did manage to, to sort of take it a bit easier on my family. This is this is something which I had to learn learn the hard way. People in AA, however, always came up with the answers and I was lucky. I, I when I left the Air Force sober. I got sober before I left the Air Force and worked for Fords and I got a job in Essex, close to London, and at that time, although there wasn't a hell of a lot of AA in Britain, and in terms of numbers of groups, there were a lot of groups in the home counties, and I was able to get to a lot of different groups without driving a long way, and and that was a great that was a great period. Uh, went on for about uh, ten years, and then then I decided, right, well the boys don't need a house near London anymore. Going back to Scotland, we went back to Scotland, and that's where I live now. Now, the other thing that I think. AA gave me, apart from sort of teaching me how to live, I was going to say again then, but I don't think I did live before, I struggled. I, from the, certainly from the time I started drinking alcoholically, life was a struggle. But I was having to relearn or learn the whole process of leading life uh, without getting upset, keeping, keeping things under control, and the only way I discovered, the only sensible way to do it, and the easiest way, and the most pleasant way to do it, was in AA. And it became, it became a kind of club for me. It became an interest. It was where I met people, it was where I met people that I knew, who under, they understood. And that was, that was what was important. Went back to Scotland, and I deliberately sort of severed myself from the kind of more materialistic life, and I, and I lived in a remote spot, and I, li and I li lead my own kind of life, but I do not lose contact with Alcoholics Anonymous. It's vital for me. There is a, there is a small group, get to the yellow box, uh, that's about 10 miles away. We meet every Thursday, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to expand a bit. I mean, there are not all that many people live on what we call the peninsula, but uh, there's plenty of scope. And in towards Glasgow, uh, there are other groups. And as you go, as you go north, actually, if you ever go to Scotland, go to the northern groups because they're great fun. Mm -hmm. They're great fun. I love the, I love the northerners and the people out on the islands. Tell me one island, a Highland Islander story. My clouds. Uh, the tourist was was on one of the very remote Hebridean islands, and there's old MacLeod. He's sitting there by himself. Uh, uh, by the pier side, and the American uh, tourist said, uh, uh, you know, have you been here long? He said, oh, the McLeod has been here for centuries. He said, your father? He said, oh, my father and my grandfather. And what do you do? I said, oh, we're the fishing, you know, and the boating. We're boating and fishing all the time. And uh, that's what we do. My father was a boater and a fisher, and my grandfather, he was my great-grandfather, great man for the boats. And the tourist said, I suppose your family came over with the ark. He says, oh no, the McLeods always had their own boat. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now, uh, I love these people, and some of them are great members of AA, and, uh, and as I say, go north. If, if you want to get some fun in AA, go north, and uh, you probably want to understand the damn word they say. Concrete. <laughs> I remember once Concrete Bob and I sailed my boat round to Loch Fine and we had an AA meeting on the boat and a couple of uh, chifters came on board, that's what we call them, chifters, 
And they and I, I couldn't understand the word they said. They, their natural tongue was Gaelic anyway, you see. But and when they spoke English, they might just as well have been speaking Gaelic as far as I was concerned. But, you know, it was still an AA meeting. I still enjoy it. That's strange. That's fun. I, I've got, uh, I've really got so, I haven't got any time. I've really got so much to say about Alcoholics Anonymous and, and my attitudes towards it and, and what it's done for me in recovery. And I haven't even touched on it. Maybe I'll get a chance to run it here for 12 days or individual discussion with people. I'd, I'd love that because I want to find out as much about uh, your attitudes to AA as, as I can because I'm sure we've got a lot to learn. And the most important thing that I, ha if I have, I don't have any message that, that would be trite and stupid of me, but what I can do is to tell you my own attitude to sobriety, base it on the fact that I am 100% uh, committed to the program as she is writ, and I wouldn't argue with it, not one little bit. And if there are bits of it that I don't quite understand now, then obviously I still have to work at it. And I'm happy to work at it, because as long as I'm working at something in it, I've still got it with me, and it's still fresh, and it's still new, and that's what I like. But the thing that's always struck me about me and Alcoholics Anonymous comes back to this thing. Am I glad I'm an alcoholic? Now, this is a question I started to ask myself after I'd had some years of sobriety. Am I glad I'm an alcoholic? And I thought, my initial reaction was, that's a stupid question. You know darn well that you wouldn't really have wanted all this pain and grief that you suffered and you made your family suffer apart from risking quite a few people's necks in the meantime. But what I meant by the question that I was asking myself was, did I feel I'd got something out of it that I wouldn't otherwise have got? And the answer to that was a very positive yes. I don't think that I would have been able to relate to other people had it not... I don't, well, first of all, let me be quite honest and say I wouldn't have been alive. I wouldn't, the choice wouldn't have occurred. But had I not been an alcoholic, I don't think I would have been able to understand what it was that made life beautiful between me and other people, and and how everything is uh, together. And now I've, I've get, I'm getting off the track here because I un, I know now that I've got an off onto my higher power straight away and you've got to figure out the connection for yourself and that was something that I took a long time understanding and still don't and, and I have spent the last year reworking step 11 and and I think I, I'm very happy reworking step 11 I need to it's been uh, it's been an eye opener but I think I can honestly say yes I'm glad, I'm, I'm terribly glad the way things turned out. And the fact that I was an alcoholic and had to go through a hell of a lot of suffering doesn't matter. Because what has come out of it has been so rewarding. And I have got things and attitudes that I wouldn't have otherwise have been able to even understand, let alone secure for myself. And in that sense, I'm glad I'm an alcoholic. But what I'm most grateful to this program for is the fact, and, and this is, some, this is the, the, the one thing that is with me all the time. This program gives us the opportunity to be the people that we have, as it were, every right to be. We were making a hash of it at one stage, but we have every right to be sensible, constructive, lead sensible, constructive lives and enjoy life and have a hell of a lot of fun out of life. And that's are right and because we went through a bad patch that doesn't deny us the ability to have that right and I maintain that that's the best thing that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me that is that is the ability the right and the ability to be the kind of person that I really feel I'm entitled to be thoughts and all okay it's not perfect, not by a long chalk, but I'm a damn sight happier with it than I was with the other thing. And that's what AA has given me. 
given me a way of life, and it's given me myself back, and it's given me my family. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the group, uh, Ian, I want to thank you. I wish you'd gone on for another hour. I was just getting warmed up listening. Maybe we'll have an encore somewhere, and uh, we'll get the second half of that story. It was um, a pleasure this evening to be with you all and to hear the universality of Alcoholics Anonymous. If there's new people here tonight, this wonderful idea that Ian so beautifully described how it touched his life and, and some of his friends in Scotland just started with a couple of people and they started carrying that message a little over 50 years ago and I think we're in 102 countries something like that and so if you're wondering if you're new you're sitting out there in your first week or two or three weeks and you're wondering if this can work, I hope you'll take heart with what you heard tonight. You are in the middle of something incredibly powerful. And don't try to figure it out. You just let it happen to yourself. You just sit back and let the people around you move you along. And I'll guarantee you, you're in for one hell of a ride. You are going to get and preserve, as Ian said, an incredible difference in your life. So if you're new, stick around. As they say, keep coming back. And we have a lovely way of closing these meetings with the Lord's Prayer for all of you that would care to join in.